Connect with your potential customers wherever they are. Effective uses Comcast viewership data insights to combine advanced targeting capabilities with premium TV and streaming content so you can deliver the best ad experiences to your audience no matter how they watch. Visit EFFECTV.com. Oscast. Hello world, I'm John Bruni and you're listening to Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. Last week, David Olney and I were in Canberra undertaking research for the Strategic Policy Grant Program Defence Grant won by SIA earlier this year. Our mission was to interview as many embassies and high commissions in the time we had to get a sense of the region called the Indo-Pacific. While we all know the main players, the United States and the People's Republic of China, few tend to look at the interplay between the smaller, less developed powers, the middle-sized powers and the large powers in totality. There seems to be a bias in international relations theory to see importance in the way large powers get what they want through coercion, manipulation or force. That somehow the smaller powers of the world have fewer interesting stories to tell, since they are by and large passive recipients of large power largesse and interest, whether for good or for ill. Furthermore, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, defining this region is a difficulty in and of itself, since much of the literature looks at core states such as India, China, Japan, Australia, Indonesia and the United States, but far less is said of the other participants in the region, such as the East African states, the microstates and dependencies of the Indian and Pacific Oceans, the states of Central and South America, and of course also missing from this region are the Gulf states, who have been for so long associated as part of the Middle East that the geographic reality that the Arabian Gulf is a tributary of the Indian Ocean is often forgotten or overlooked by scholars and policy practitioners alike. Our job is to fill in the blanks and attempt to give a better account of our understanding of the Indo-Pacific so that Australian policymakers have a more complete picture to work with while they formulate government strategic priorities. So far, we're off to an excellent start, but there is still a while to go before we complete our research and write up our findings. Nonetheless, in this episode, we'll start off by outlining what is the Indo-Pacific, why is the region so important, And what advantages could Australia have by having this complete and, dare I say, complex understanding of the region at hand? In the studio with me today are collaborator David Olney and interrogator Tim Whiffen. Before we start today's episode, I would like to remind listeners that Strategicon can be found on the Ozcast Network, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, and on the Sage International Australia website, www.sageinternational.org.au. Welcome mm. to the studio, John Bruni. Uh, thank you very much, Tim. And welcome to the studio, David Olney. Thank you very much, Tim. I'm uh, pleased to hear you guys had a good trip, but we'll start getting into it. We won't bother with the niceties. I want to kind of grill you a little bit today. Uh, now, small countries tend to fare much better internationally than one might expect. From your experience, why would this be the case? Well, because they're small countries, they have to be nimble in the way that they approach the world. Otherwise, they're going to be railroaded by the larger countries. And the interesting thing here was that, you know, from the observations of our trip, uh, the key thing that really hit me, and it hit me hard in the first meeting with uh, the, uh, the ambassador of the day, I won't name names, but, you know, he came from a small country and a country that you would think would have been quite easily railroaded by some of the regional giants. And he basically said, this is uh, the foreign policy that we subscribe to, and it was a very rational foreign, po- foreign policy. And what it did was it leveraged off um, regional powers, other great powers, extraterritorial powers. What they ended up doing was creating a foreign policy where they were everyone's friend. Well, you know, at least friend in the loosest sense of the term, friend in a diplomatic way, very pragmatic as well. This particular country had uh, enduring trade relations over the live sheep trade. 
and you know as an example and of course when we protested against the live sheep trade uh, they didn't quite understand it because they thought it was money in our pocket and they were doing us a favor so basically they looked for another market you know so there's a there's a degree of ruthlessness i i suppose you know in terms of how they exercise their pragmatic approach in matters of diplomacy they will not be railroaded they will look for alternative supply routes they will look for friends beyond the uh, the usual suspects you know to ensure that they can leverage off whatever power group that they are playing with mm. i'll add a few things to that that you know, complementary and sort of add another layer i hope i think the first thing is a lot of small countries exist beside other small countries and they have a lot of historical experience of seeing that you can either endlessly squabble with your neighbors and waste time, resources and opportunities to develop, or you can start to work together to build a better neighbourhood. And the better the neighbourhood becomes, the faster individual countries can develop. So there was an interesting awareness in all the small countries we spoke to that if they're busy transitioning from, say, you know, the, the post-colonial moment or through a violent or authoritarian phase into a democratic phase, wanting to consolidate the democratic phase, more of their energy will be internal. But they still want good relations with their neighbours. And once they've got the time and the resources to add value to their neighbourhood, by trying to treat everyone as fairly as possible, that seemed to be their default setting. The other side of this too is the majority of small countries we spoke to will try and get along amicably. So the word friendship gets used regularly, but it's not friendship as best friends forever. It's not a commitment until death. It's a commitment to behave well, to be polite, to be considerate, but also to not allow yourselves to be victims of other people's power. Mm. So a very interesting thing where because they've had to go alone and be subject to the powerful forces of the world as a whole... They are better at dealing with strong winds and big waves than I think the majority of middle or large powers would expect. How do small countries like this balance that desire for friendship with their inherent need for trade? I think the big thing that came through, and John can add anything I miss here because we learnt so much in a week it's hard to keep it all in our heads. To me, the really sophisticated thing we saw nonstop all week talking to people was they don't confuse trade and friendship you need to trade through trade you might develop a friendship through a friendship between countries you might develop trade but the two don't have to go together business can just be business and friendship can be with people you may not trade with so it's about working consistently to improve the quality of relations and the fairness of trade Look, I agree with David. I think one of the things that really surprised me was the fact that you tend to think, okay, you've got a developing country in a corner, a small country, small population. Obviously, if you look at standard international relations theory, you know, power flows from the top down. It doesn't go from the bottom up. And quite frankly, the level of interviews that we had so far with many embassies are very much are about small to medium sized countries that seem to be able to invert that pyramidal shape, that hierarchical nature of, of relations. But going back on to the trade issue, one of the other observations that we had was that we in Australia, but also in other democratic countries as well, we tend to seize on issues that tend to uh, spark popular imagination, you know, like there's a core celebrity. Now, you know, we made mention of the live sheep trade as an example earlier, but the thing is that there are a whole heap of other things that actually stand in the way of how we can relate to other countries because we allow our public nuances to go into the diplomatic sphere. Now, it could be announced because it's on the front page of a newspaper and then it bounces around various media circles, goes back to the diplomatic circuit. The diplomatic circuit of the countries involved look at Australia and say, well, look, you know, this is really important to us, this particular thing, or we're just not ready to make the transition from, you know, what we're doing now to what you want us to do. But if you're going to make a big deal about it, we're just going to burn you. And I think, again, you know, as David was saying, it, 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 friendship is... It's not what we in in the in the public would expect. You know, it's it's a much more nuanced approach, and they they do make these very pragmatic decisions based on what they can tolerate. Now, whether or not it's you know about women's rights, gay rights, 
political rights generally or anything else, you know there's a developmental path that they're wedded to. And if it means that they'll get to where Australia is in 50 or 100 years' time, they'll take that step. And they don't care how much we protest that we want them to be like us now. They will not, mm. they will not operate on that level. They'll operate to their own level. They'll take their incremental steps. They will review each incremental step. And then they will build on that to make their development possible. But they will not be rushed. And that's one of the key uh, things that we came away from Canberra with is that certain countries, you know, it's not that they don't agree with the idea of having a more liberal body politic. They just don't want to be cajoled into it. They want the local people to develop their own processes and whether or not Australian people or government likes what they do right now, it's quite irrelevant to them. Mm -hmm. They'd rather, you know, that we engage with them positively. But if we don't, they will get on with their development and nation building process with or without us. Yeah. And just lock in small gain, reassess, mm. small gain, reassess. And they have an ideal of where they want to get to. Yeah. But unlike a lot of Western powers who would say, you must be here and we are going to hold this thing against you. Mm. They are looking for a bar that says these people deal fairly there is nothing about how they behave that we find intolerable to deal with. So let's try and find a way forward because with greater connection and interaction, everyone wins. Mm -hmm. you know, everyone rubs off on each other. Civil behaviour is infectious mm. was the, really the sense I got all week. Which raises another issue, which we did raise while we were doing our interviews, and that is that we in Australia, we tend to view things with the rose-coloured glasses of multiculturalism. And not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but you have to look at it from this perspective. When you think that you're being tolerant internally, you know, within your own body politic, why is it so hard for the government of this country to, you know, apply those same rules when looking at other countries? You know, we expect other countries to behave by our standards and all of a sudden the intolerance for different cultural and political diversity seems to be the cause of the day. I think that we need to really quite kind of reassess and take a, a step back from our, dare I say, unrealistic expectations of, of many of the developing mm -hmm. countries in the Indo-Pacific. Yeah, there's a sort of good question in here for people into identity politics, mm -hmm. is why is it we entertain identity politics to the degree we do yeah. inside a single country, but not entertain that identity politics is as critical an issue across the globe as a whole. And that if you have populations with a high degree of continuity about their identity because of you know their sort of cultural linguistic heritage, that in some ways makes life easier for them to move forward as a group, but also that they're going to move forward as a group in their own way and in their own time seems as if the their idea of identity politics within a culture conflicts with thinking about identity politics amongst cultures. It's I'd say that is the Western problem. Yeah. I'd say most of these countries have the experience of either being very homogenous or very diverse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they tend to be more extreme in either direction than a country like Australia. Yeah. They're either, you know, it's one group of people who can show commonality for such a long time or it's groups who have found a compromise to not kill each other mm -hmm. yep. and have been not killing each other for a very long time. Mm -hmm. In both cases, it's different to our multicultural experiment within an advanced liberal democracy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the same way we want to be seen as the uniqueness that is Australian multiculturalism, mm -hmm. we need to make sure that it's not just lip service about other people's uniqueness. Mm. I'm still interested in this idea of being quite friendly with one another and how they kind of separate this idea of friendship and, and trade. Do you find that that exists amongst some of the medium to larger countries as well? Like are, are people separating, say, for instance, the US and China, mm. are they separating friendship and trade? Oh, well, they are now. They yeah. are now. Yeah. yeah. But again, there's the delusion at that big end of town, in my opinion, that the two must go together. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's part of the thing that, you know, when we talk about power in the West... We talk about enemies. No, it's rivals. Mm -hmm. Competitors US and China are rivals yeah. or competitors. Yeah. But that is the word. Mm. And rivals can behave politely. Rivals can abide by a basic standard mm -hmm. of polite behaviours for interaction. But then if you look at like, you know, what's happening between the US and the PRC, there is an interest in driving 
something beyond being polite now. Yeah. I mean, there's an interest on both sides, both in Beijing But there wasn't and politeness there in the first place. No, there wasn't. So really, it's got worse. Yeah. But there wasn't really... There, and, you know, friendship's not the ideal word either. It's just the best word we have for what mm. we encountered a lot last week. You know, people want to build the politest, most stable, most beneficial neighbourhood they can. So what we're really talking about here is something a bit like the traditional public-private divide. Mm. Yeah? Know how to behave like a global citizen in public. Mm. Privately, be whatever culture you are. Be the person and people you are. But know how to you know, behave appropriately to interact with other countries in other ways so that no one loses you know, no one loses a sense of identity or a sense of being taken seriously. So uh, it's, it's very respectful what we encountered last week. Respectful diplomacy, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, w- I would say amicable diplomacy. Amic- yeah, I think amicable, amicable is a great word. Yeah, it, it, it sort of captures the idea of wanting to be a friend without necessarily being a friend, because mm. being a friend can lead you up the garden path, quite frankly. Sure. Mm. Yeah. So amicability sure. is a really, yeah, it's a really good word for what we encountered mm. and talked about last mm-hmm. week. Mm-hmm. So the West has a tradition of pragmatic politics, I guess like you're talking about, and you know, we think that we're rather pragmatic. However, the small to medium countries, you're talking about them being pragmatic as well. Is that pragmatic in the way that we understand it? It sounds like it's slightly different. No, and uh, actually last night was really interesting because last night I was invited to one of the local universities to do one of these career night things, right? Mm-hmm. And the people who were present, uh, all young, idealistic, and uh, some of them were actually quite open about it, you know, saying I want to work for an NGO because I want to make the world a better place and so on and so forth. I think that our version of pragmatism, we give lip service to pragmatism without necessarily being pragmatic because a lot of the junior people who get flushed out of the university system, they come into government with all these ideas about changing the world and stuff like that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. This is not a criticism of that. But what it does is it makes one push particular agendas within government. And I think at some level it creates a sort of expectation at the highest level because, you know, the media plays on a lot of these, you know, these agendas and so on and so forth. They become politicised. And when we talk about pragmatism, we're talking about things around the edges. But when we're talking about other countries in the Indo-Pacific, many of whom don't have a free press, many of the countries actually have a government basically running everything, every yeah. aspect of their lives, it allows them in a more natural way to have continuity of policy. In in our case, we don't have continuity of policy. We have the two and a half to three year electoral cycle when the government changes, so does the grand strategic agenda or narrative change of the country. And so it's very difficult for public servants necessarily to keep on top of the political process and also to rein in some of the worst instincts of our politicians who can say some really damaging things publicly that then reverberate in the diplomatic circuit. And they, mm. you know, these guys sit back and say, are you actually serious about dealing with us? Do you really know what we're under? And this comes down to a very basic thing. And that is from what David and I uh, you know, encountered – the ability for us to really listen. Now, I mean, we know about hearing and listening, the differences between the two, but we need to really listen to what these people are saying because without listening, they tend to think that we're just ignoring whatever they're doing mm. and then it leads them down you know, the, the, the road of saying, well, you know, Australia doesn't really care about us you know, mm. and, uh, and we consider ourselves irrelevant to you. And I think from a diplomatic perspective, that's not really where we want our country to be. If we want to continue to punch above our weight, we must always take the smaller countries into consideration, the less developed countries into consideration, if we want to be able to influence them in a positive way. Mm -hmm. David? I think I'll try and use a spectrum to make sense of this pragmatism thing, because I've been struggling to work out exactly what I think we encountered and how it differs to the Western model. I would argue that Australia, as an example of the West, has a spectrum. One end is, you know, idealism, how we will, you know, want the world to be. The other end is an absolute relativism. And in the main, we flick too extremely between the two. We're either too idealistic and not practical enough, or if the ideals can't be achieved, we are relativistic and go for short-term gains. I think what I would argue is that what we encountered is a genuine pragmatism, a point in the middle where these countries never lose sight of the ideal they would like to achieve, but also never give in to total relativism, which would be sacrificing their identity and their long-term path of development. Mm. So 
there is a an ability to keep sight of the end goal and an ability to adapt and do different things but without becoming totally relativistic. Mm. So neither are they being utopian or totally relativistic. They've found a way to have a middle path that says maintain the ideal and adapt to move towards it, but incrementally. And the ideal may forever be unattainable, Mm. but it gives you something to aim at. So there's an acceptance in their pragmatism of balancing uncomfortable realities that here's how you'd like the world, but here's how you find it. Mm. And rather than capitulating to either, they just accept the combination of the two. Well, it's not they just accept. They are sophisticated enough to combine the two and maintain a reasonably consistent path mm. relative to a lot of Western politics. Mm. So they, they are comfortable with uncertainty as well. That's, mm. an, that's another observation. You know, many of the countries of the Indo-Pacific, you know, especially the, uh, from the lesser developed areas, you know, they understand there's a realism about the way that they approach things. And in, within that realism, they seem to be very comfortable with the idea that things can go pear-shaped very quickly mm-hmm. and it will have an effect on their developmental goals. Mm-hmm. So it's not like, you know, they need us to tell them what to do or how to go about their business. They're quite, they're quite aware of everything that happens around them. And I think that that situational awareness is something that isn't well enough known about the countries in question because – as I say, we generally don't listen to them. We tell them what to do, how to think, what we expect, but we are not very good at basically listening to what they're saying and what they would require from us. Mm. So mm. for an example, something like the, you know, the international rules-based order, mm. it is both an ideal and a basic standard of how countries interrelate. But it seems often in the West, if we can't have the ideal version, we have a tantrum and a demand that other people meet the ideal. Mm. What's wrong with consolidating a basic level that everyone can then incrementally build on? Mm. You've still got your ideal. You've worked out, okay, we can only get you know, to this level now. Well, let's lock it in. Let's lock in small gains now that put as many countries as possible on a path towards an interconnected, interdependent future. But I suppose you'll have people in DFAT saying, well, that's exactly what we're doing. But uh, again, you know, DFAT is a very bifurcated system where you've got a lot of areas doing a lot of interesting things and then some areas not necessarily looking at things from that perspective. And we're not really comfortable with that sort of diversity of view within government as well, which makes us a a difficult customer to deal with, I would think. Mm. What you're suggesting is that they're kind of politically dependent and obviously they're trade dependent because they're small. How do yeah, but these, everyone's trade dependent. Well, yeah, there's no such thing as autarky at the moment. <laughs> how, how do these small and to, small to medium countries feel about dependence and interdependence within the international Well, order? I think they'd immediately challenge using the word dependent. Mm. They mm. are working towards interdependence mm. with the recognition that a raft of small things together will inevitably do better than a raft of small things separately. So dependence is the problem they work against. Okay. I would just like to add that in terms of their security, by getting as many people on their diplomatic good side as possible, or as many countries on their diplomatic good side as possible. Well, let's turn that into diplomatic amicable side. Now we've got this good word. Yes. Well, when we have that sort of coasting in these particular countries, what happens is that they will be able to better defend themselves, their interests, and also allow themselves to influence their neighbourhood in a way that we're, we're, we're literally incapable of understanding, which is actually quite fascinating. Yeah, we haven't doubled down, it seems, on the cultural knowledge necessary to see where the little gains could happen you know, at a reasonable pace. Just little gain after little gain after little gain. Mm-hmm. Because that would be not saying that we can achieve the grand policy vision in a three or six year cycle. Mm. You know, we're talking to people who understand that their nations are on a 50 year plan. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, on that alone, you know, from a security perspective, again, we tend to be stuck in this uh, never ending debate about Australia having to choose between, uh, you know, our trade with China on the one hand and our security uh, agreements with the United States on the other. And, and look, you know, Australia is not the only country in the Indo-Pacific that is, quote unquote, 
forced to consider these, you know, this unfortunate choice, if you will. But, you know, the way that the smaller to medium-sized countries in the Indo-Pacific deal with it is very sophisticated. Again, they know what pressures they're under, but rather than just cave into them and get caught up in this pointless public debate, they just look for coalition partners, if you will, you know, trade mm, partners, the political partners, whatever. possible and to they maintain just, good relations with both. Correct, correct. So they don't feel intimidated, I suppose is the right word here, they don't feel as intimidated by what's happening in the Sino-American split. They, they recognise it, they think mm. that it's bad internationally, but they're not freaked out by it and they don't believe that their national securities are necessarily affected by this because they've moved beyond the, the, the black and white narrative and, and we haven't seemed to have done that as a sophisticated middle power in the, uh, in the South Pacific. Well, mm. I suppose the thing is that you know, potentially if it ever came to a shooting war, between the PRC and the United States because of ANZUS. Mm. We're going to get sucked into it. So many small nations aren't. Yeah. They're going to live in the world before, during and after said potential war mm. without hopefully being directly involved. They will be affected. They'll be but affected, they but they yeah. won't necessarily be directly involved. Correct. So they try and appreciate the world from the perspective of being affected by it, but not wanting to be involved in some of these you know, pressurised situations. Yeah. Mm. Sidestepping. That's what yeah. they do. And they do it very well. Mm. Mm. So sovereignty uh, is important to all countries, big and small. But did you notice anything while you were on your trip uh, emerge as being equally important uh, but different about small to medium-sized countries? David? I think the big thing that came out, and we went assuming that sovereignty would be critical because when you're little, hanging on to what you got is even more important. But from having taught stuff about societal security for years, the idea that security is really about defending us being able to be us, that is a lot of what we engaged with last week was the idea of people wanting to protect their sense of self. So even though national boundaries are important, being the people they want to be, I think was equally as important, perhaps even more important, because that's the thing that makes them unique. Mm. So really pre- preserving the status quo in many ways is their primary national security driver. Okay. You know, they don't want anything to upset the status quo. If anything does blow in from left field and upset that, they're very well aware of the fact, you know, that they'll be on thin ice essentially. So what they want to do is they want to just, you know, continue to perpetuate the current situation where, you know, they can they can play their little role in the international community, they can strive for the development goals, they can strive in, in small increments, you know, as I said, uh, mm-hmm. and as David has said, I think that that is really their their most important aim and directive. Mm-hmm. Whether or not they can con- continue to do that is is really up to, to Australia, up to the United States, up to China, you know, and making sure that, you know, the, uh, the craziness that we currently see on the front page of every newspaper mm-hmm. doesn't get out of hand. Because really that is going to be the thing that upends yeah. everything. The so cra- that, craziness has become a contagion in places like Australia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. The everyday, what's going to happen next between China and US? Mm. I'd say the sophistication of small and medium countries wanting to maintain their identity and having a deep sense of societal security mm-hmm. is that with a deep sense of self, that contagion is something you look at, but you don't necessarily get affected by. Sure. Mm. Of fear for the sake of fear. Yep. We didn't encounter the kind of fear for the sake of fear that is characteristic in the West since 9-11. Mm-hmm. Mm. Is that actually what they're achieving, though? Are they achieving that sovereignty, that, that sense of self, being able to be self-directed? Are they achieving that at the moment? Is that Well, if you look at the way that some of the regional states in the Indo-Pacific are forging ahead, I mean, some of them are quite open to allowing the Chinese presence to come in, not only at a commercial level, but also at mm-hmm. a security level. And I suppose if you look at it from their local perspective, you could say that they're trying to hedge against American dominance or Australian dominance or Western dominance generally. So they think by inviting the Chinese in, they have a check and balance against what they would otherwise consider Western dominance of their geopolitical positioning. In the end, it will take a great degree of sophisticated understanding of Chinese motives to allow that check and balance to work to their favour. Mm-hmm. But I think that, you know, as we said, I, I believe that there is that sophistication. Mm-hmm. We have to convince ourselves that these countries know what they're doing. Okay. Well, and I think that that's why we're always trying to sort of, okay, the Chinese have landed a brown paper bag of money uh, in, at some countries' uh, footsteps. Then we have to actually counter that. Do we have to counter it? I mean, are we... 
that behind the times in terms of our influence in the region? I, I, I suspect not. I, I think that there's a lot of media-driven fear about China, which means that every move that a local community makes to engage the Chinese turns into a national security threat to Australia mm-hmm. because we are tied by ANZUS to the United States. Mm-hmm. The US, what the US sees as a primary threat then trickles down to Canberra, and that's how we also see mm-hmm. our national security environment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think what I'd add to this is that small and medium states in our region – if given more choices, will choose more partners to balance how influence and interdependence spreads and is developed in the region. Mm-hmm. So when they only have a choice of China or the US, well, they go with it realising they would have liked to have had three choices. So whether the model works or not is dependent on things beyond their control. Mm. But the underlying sense of how to do diplomacy – that we encountered last week was let's do as many things under our control to balance and stabilise the world through deep and broad networks. And that as a model of, you know, a sophisticated model to deal with, you know, superpower politics, there's not a better one available. Mm. You know, as a quote unquote middle power, Australia feels the tension too strongly being pulled in two directions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the question then that raises for me, based on our experiences from last week, is: is our network of connections broad and deep enough to provide a counterbalance to that big push pull? Mm-hmm. My feeling is it isn't, but that it should be. Mm-hmm. I also think that we've we've actually adopted a rather ham-fisted approach with our dealings with the PRC as well, especially with regard to the sale of the port of Darwin and and various other things that have happened over the last few years uh, in terms of our relationship with China, we could have handled a lot of these things better and we could have shown a level of sophistication that would be equal to the countries that we spoke to. Somehow we've chosen another path. Whether that other path is going to be good for us in the long term, Lord only knows. Mm. So do you think these small to medium countries, uh, do they have what it takes uh, to be, I guess, so ruthless in their own national interests to uh, align themselves so diversely? That takes balls. No, well, it, it, it really does. I think that so long as nothing happens to the international system as it's currently structured, I think that there'll be ample room for small to medium sized countries in the Indo-Pacific to exercise their rights and to continue doing what they're doing. Hmm. But, you know, of course, we are dealing with potential black swans out there. And those black swans may not come from the small to medium sized countries in the Indo-Pacific. They may come from a breakdown of international relations between the Chinese and the Americans on the one side, or they may come from a complete re invention of the European Union, I don't know. You know, Mm. at the moment there are a lot of things in flux in certain parts of the world and they will have an effect on how small to medium countries in the Indo-Pacific choose to engage the world or whether or not their their choice is going to be curbed in some way that we cannot foresee at this present time. Mm. I think I'd maybe change the language from ruthless to a combination of clear-sighted and focused. And if you're clear-sighted and focused, you are more situationally aware you see things coming earlier, you know, like Tetris. You've got the greatest chance of turning the rock around, making it land right. Mm. But if it's 10 huge rocks, you just can't do it in time. Yeah. So proportionally to their ability to affect their futures, enhanced situational awareness because of being clear-sighted and focused can only be to their benefit. Hmm. You're listening to Strategicon, where on this episode, I'm talking to John and David about their recent trip to Canberra for their defence grant. Today's musical interlude comes courtesy of a local Adelaide band, Big Uncle Love Bus, with their track, Dog in the Sky.
Dog in the Sky by Big Uncle Love Bus. Check out the band's details in the episode description. We return now to the conversation between myself, Tim, and John and David about their impression of the small to medium-sized countries they interviewed in Canberra. You were talking about how Australia is put in the position of choosing between the PRC and the US. And well, we ha- put ourselves in the position. That sure. became evident last week. We put ourselves in the position. Mm. Everyone has to work out how to most effectively function on planet Earth. And that means you need to make choices early and you need to make choices to establish a a base level position that Mm. allows you the most flexibility and the most ability to cope. Do you think the inception, though, of that idea came from Washington or or, or press over there, though? Do you think that there's pressure from that? No, it came from Australia. It's it's residual to being part of the British Empire and then Churchill not wanting to let us have troops back and then desperately needing the Americans and being so used to desperately wanting a big friend. Mm -hmm. A big friend-itis. I think is the Australian disease. Sure. And so you've said that the media is to, to blame for a lot of how we've put ourselves into this position. You know, if you look at someone like Rupert Murdoch, who's effectively our largest media mogul in Australia, lives in the US, though. That, to me, seems like a narrative that comes from the US that then lands here. And he was an Adelaide boy as well. So yeah. Well. <laughs> mm. <laughs> There's mm. a South Australian connection that dare not speak its name. Yeah. But look, I mean, I, I think that the fact that we don't have a broad and diverse media anymore mm. does not benefit us in okay. terms of the way that other countries see Australia or the United States or any Western state for that matter, mm-hmm. because I mean, the, the, the truncation of media sources is a Western disease. It's mm-hmm. all over the place. Mm-hmm. And the closer media moguls get to the center of political power, the easier it is to see. Now, I don't know whether they're consciously aware of it or not, but there are collusive elements that take place where, you know, if you're the only guy, the media baron at the table, then you've got, you know, uh, Facebook chiefs of staff and various other people of political power all sitting around the same table and they're, you know, drinking a nice 16 year old whiskey. Of course, they start talking about Mm. common interests and then it's easy for, you know, a a handful of people to start gravitating toward each other, not being consciously aware of the fact Mm. that they are actually doing that. Mm. And then that sets up a pattern of how things are then communicated to the people. So if the people start seeing a narrative develop, Mm. it's one of those things where they just accept it essentially yeah they think it's true it's so you're saying that that is and it's mostly a western plague though so this is something i'm assuming you're saying doesn't necessarily affect some of these small to medium well they don't yet have press freedom so they're in a different situation Uh, i think the other side of this beyond breadth of coverage what is sadly lacking in dealing with any of these issues is depth of coverage oh yes yeah so yeah so really (laughs) you know the breadth thing breadth is awesome Mm. but if it's shallow, it's a pancake. Mm, mm. What's the advantage? We, we need a depth of analysis, a depth of public debate, a depth of public discussion. And how that depth is created is harder to manage. You know, breadth mm. of media you can deal with with media laws. Mm-hmm. Depth of analysis is a who are we, what are we, how do we want to be nation-building how does our nation face the world type mm. issue? It is a deeper political issue rather than just a media issue. The media is where we see the problem. 
but the deeper issue is a lack of political and historical understanding of the nature of how the world became the way it is mm. and how it didn't get there through single big decisions. It got through thousands of little decisions mm. made over extended periods mm. of time, which is a way to re-empower a population and states to understand mm. that you don't need to change course by 90 degrees. Mm. You might only need to change course by two or three degrees, just enough to miss the asteroid. Mm. Mm. So the, the depth issue could divulge into a, a, a completely separate philosophical Absolutely. discussion because there are, there are far too many things to know, far too many things to go into depth for, for to have public discussion on you know, everything, let's say. So yeah, breadth and depth is, it could be an interesting discussion for another time. But I'm still interested, if they don't have press freedom, how the small and medium countries react to the version of you know, the PRC versus the US issue. Well, okay, uh, here, here's, uh, here's an example of how they actually do it. One of the countries that we spoke to, a small country in the Indo-Pacific, they have a very broad education system where a lot of their most highly qualified people go to a number of the larger powers to get educated. So they would go to Russia, All over the China, yeah. the United States and Europe, a European country, whether France or Germany. And then they come back with their respective expertise. They sit around the table and sort of work out what it is, what is the best thing that they ought to be able to bring in from that level of expertise that they learn from abroad. That, again, is something that I think helps them overcome a lot of their size-related issues or the development-related issues. Because when you have an educated elite that has broadly studied and then come back, and it's all part of a you know, strategic-level decision of the, of the government in question, you can, you can harvest the human capital afterwards. But if your education system is kind of introverted, very isolated, uh, and what you do is you, you send people abroad in a haphazard kind of fashion, the outcomes are always going to be haphazard and questionable. I don't want to be too critical about the Australian education system, especially the tertiary education system, but, you know, we have our issues over here. And I think that it goes even uh, to the point where we were discussing earlier about, you know, media depth, you know, mm. depth of coverage. Well, if you if you don't focus on the education of the young people coming through at the university level and, you know, people are only used to seeing superficial media reporting, mm -hmm. that is what they absorb. But if they're yeah. if used to getting it, something... It's different. Yeah. If it's all you know, it, yeah. does right. make, it, makes, a, yeah, it makes a difference. Correct. So. And the simple thing that you know, we're only just starting to see here now, that to do an international relations degree, you have to spend one semester away. Mm. How is this not normal seeing we have the resources to mandate a system where people get maximum exposure? Yeah. If small countries can send people all over the world to get high quality education and more importantly, cultural knowledge about the rest of the world. If they can use their limited resources to get that level of connectedness and understanding, what are we doing with our larger bundle of resources? Not doing the same thing. It's an interesting point. You know, education is a, an important thing and an important area to Australia. We have many policy discussions about that in politics. It tends to be one of the largest things that we discuss in, in our uh, elections. But maybe maybe we're being too, uh, maybe we're too confident in our own system that we see no need in sending anyone elsewhere. So what does education mean to well, small and medium-sized countries? I think the problem is our debate is not high quality. Mm. We debate, should we spend this much money on education? But where is the important question? To what end? Mm. 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 To yeah. what end do we want 40% of young Australians to have degrees? Well, we don't have a strategic level setting to allow us to have those kind of debates. And then there's the other you know, <laughs> elephant in the room, and that is uh, our neoliberal view of education. You know, I mean, yeah, it's all about the money. public good, we've seen it as a cash cow. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, or, or, or a drain on net resources. Oh, well, if the money, if the money could be better spent on uh, another hospital or n another road, oh, God help me, another road work in Adelaide. Mm -hmm. oh, let's, not, <laughs> let's not go there. I've got a story I can tell about last night's travel back from the university to home. You know, th there are all these kind of issues that come forward to the fore, and I think that we, ne we really need to try to address um, the fact that education is a social good it is a national and a strategic benefit. good, and, which and we don't see it as. exactly. But the small to medium countries do. Yes, yes, most definitely. Yes, they do. Education mm. is a strategic issue because mm. they know without their educational resources, they can't reach their development goals. Mm -hmm. So you or know, their while, connectedness goals. Oh, mm. absolutely, absolutely. Mm. So you know, on on resources, uh, as these small countries uh, develop to have um, surplus excess uh, resources, what do you think? What do they tend to do with them? 
I mean, it's clearly not the case for education because it's not really an ex- exportable good. But yeah, once they've got surpluses, the consistent thing was to improve the neighbourhood. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's that, 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 that is true. That's the most consistent thing yeah. because being small countries are very often beside other small countries, mm. Mm. and historically one. they can mm. see that their most unstable neighbour, who is prone to violence. Mm lags decades behind in terms of development. Mm-hmm. So they don't need to look very far for what happens if they drop the ball. Mm. I, I think what was really um, quite um, impressed upon us uh, was from the African and Middle Eastern regions. I mean, the, those states are very aware of their neighbours' foibles. And, and not know, in terms of pointing blame, but realising if that happens to us, we, we're gone. the outcome is going to be as bad as it was for them. So, so don't let the problem happen in the first place. Correct. And, and that goes back to what we were saying earlier about many of these countries, their primary aim is to shore up the system as it currently is structured. It is of no one's interest to undermine that construct because the contagion of a failed state in the neighbourhood... It's just too big and too dangerous mm, for yeah. most of them. Yeah. So, you know, from a Latin American perspective, Venezuela mm. affects all the surrounding countries' ability mm. to move forward in the way they're trying. Yep. And yet they all have to help. Mm. Because if they don't help, the implication of a refugee crisis mm. in countries where resources are already limited, healthcare is already limited, infrastructure is still mm. limited. Mm. Well, you, you see that in Chile at the moment. I yeah. mean, what have they got? About 300,000 Venezuelan refugees? Well, they've just what had to cancel APEC, haven't they? Yep. Yep. So, I mean, if you're talking about, you know, the financial limits on some of these countries, you know, they they still will try to find some money to throw at a problem, a regional related problem, because it will directly affect, affect them, them if they cannot mm. solve it mm. or at least ameliorate the worst elements of it. Mm-hmm. So the key thing that comes out of this too that we observed is we live on a big island, mm. but we think like landlocked people. Mm-hmm. We yeah. think like people who only think about our land. Because you know, it's so big and then there's big water. So it's like, oh, whatever's out there's not really our problem or our issue. Whereas most people we spoke to, the sea is a highway and they don't have land borders, sort of contiguous land like we do with an island. They have borders with other countries. So the sea is a highway and they all share borders with multiple countries. Mm. And, not, and not seeing waterways is an obstacle like we do. Because, I mean, Australia... Uh, historically has suffered from... Should have been a maritime power. Well, we should have been a... Yeah, well... You know, because basically we, uh, you know, under under the British colonial system, we, we, we are a continental power. Mm. We, we could le- leverage off the naval power of Great Britain. We didn't have to worry about too much. Um, and, and so therefore we started thinking ourselves as an isolated land power. Mm. And the only thing that we could ever contribute abroad is, you know, lots of troops, uh, mm. which mm. would be transported via British ships to Europe or... Or what know, other, other places disaster we got sucked into by a bigger power. Mm. Exactly. And we haven't quite recovered from that level of thinking because we have, um, in many ways, morphed that thinking to our alliance with the United States. Mm-hmm. I mean, to a much smaller degree, obviously, because now weapons cost so much more. So, you know, we can only afford to deliver penny packet forces around the place. But still, it's the same kind of methodology. Mm-hmm. We think as a land power, landlocked power, an isolated power, and we think that the only thing that we can contribute... Uh, to the United States is a penny packet of forces that we can send off to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I'm hearing a narrative, especially what what you were talking about just a little bit earlier, I'm hearing this kind of narrative that maybe despite the fact that they're um, not as socially progressive, these these small to medium countries are not as socially progressive as maybe we would expect, or at least they're not doing it in a time frame which would please us. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, uh, there is uh, a... Policy that so the policies tend to invest in people. There are things that seem to improve communities, improve education, improve the lives of, let's say, a majority of people, if not the minorities. We, as Australia, don't don't necessarily have that exact outlook, and I think maybe a large part of that, and some and for some reason that our communities are are failing. I think personally, might come down to consumer grade technology, um, but let's say more broadly. Um, you know, technology is important to everyone, like not, not just consumer grade technology, but everything that states use in terms of defense and all those kinds of things. So technology is important to everyone. How do these small to medium sized countries understand even our use of technology or how they could use it? How do they understand technology and how do they want to make use of it? 
Well, the, the most important thing that we got out of it is that many of these countries, the, the developing countries of the Indo-Pacific, know what their technological limitations are. Mm-hmm. They also know what they want from the West. But interestingly enough, the West is not good at listening about what their requirements are. Mm-hmm. There are many countries that haven't gotten beyond 3G communications uh, networks at the moment, you mm-hmm. know, and, and they currently have got the 3G down pat. They understand how it works. And they're only able to support that level of technology. They're comfortable supporting that level of technology, but they can't go beyond it. But we're going into 5G, and we believe that if we're wanting to do good by the rest of the world, everyone has to jump up to our standards, whether they're ready to operate their technology mm-hmm. or not. Mm-hmm. Now, from a developing world perspective, it looks as though, you know, here goes the arrogant West, you know, telling us what to do. I mean, we don't have the technical capacity to operate 5G, so why would we want to have those networks come into the country mm-hmm. when we're not when when we are not ready for them. Uh, another thing is, you know, for instance, farming equipment or, you know, even military equipment. What is the point of, you know, selling a developing world country, a stealth fighter bomber, when they have no capacity to look after it? It'll just look pretty on the tarmac until the weather, you know, makes its uh, presence felt and the thing falls apart from rust. Mm. Similarly, farm equipment, you know, there's a level of technology that these guys still still don't have. I mean, in many cases uh, in Africa and Latin America, farms are, uh, you know, you've got your plough and you've got your oxen. And, uh, you know, if, if we put a 21st century Australian John Deere tractor on one of these farms to help them lift their productivity, and yet the local farmer doesn't know how to get into one of these things, let alone operate the, uh, the, the system, how pointless is that? So again, we have to Uh, lower our expectations as to what we can possibly do to help these countries progress Mm. with their levels of technology. David? Yeah, I think an important thing here is to realise that all technology has a life cycle. And we've got used to a very short life cycle and to just roll on to the next thing because of the limitations of technical experience and resources to pay for technology. They need technology with longer life cycles. They need appropriate technology to do what they want to do, not to have the best technology in the world. Which raises, you know, the interesting question from Australian perspective. You know, we don't manufacture a lot of technology. Mm. But what we could do is provide a lot of training on how to manage, repair, design, you know, Im- affect improve technology. Mm. So technology is not an issue that any single country can solve for another country. Mm-hmm. They need to work out what they want to achieve and then need multiple partners to both get the technology, get the training, get the support, get the mentoring so they can own it and manage its life cycle as effectively as possible. So how much of our role, how much how much do we need to play a role in that? Because if they don't understand the technology, they can't possibly understand what they need. Oh, no, they understand oh, they know the technology. Okay, sorry, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again, this is the advantage of a diplomatic court all out around the world learning. Yeah. They know exactly what's available. Okay. And they also know generally what level they need and know okay. more than that. Right. Our role needs to be to go, well, we probably can't supply the physical technology because we don't build it. Mm-hmm. But we could play a big part in helping them developing an appropriate level of technology to its limits, which they might be able to do on their own within their budget. Mm -hmm. So our role in technology is a development and training role, not a provide hardware role. Interesting. One one of the things that uh, came through from one of the African embassies that we spoke to was that, you know, you Australians have a lot of stuff that basically once you've done with it, you throw it in a scrap heap. Totally. You know, why don't you work an aid program where you can say, well, you know, this stuff is still good and it's workable. Send it off to the country in question. Let them play with it. And, you know, better still send some of your technicians across so they can help teach our local people how to maintain these things into the future. That would keep a lot of people employed because we're starting to get things that are no longer serviceable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Well, we'll see, the thing is that, you know, uh, we made the, the joke, well, you know, what happens when we end up having flying cars, you know, mm. in, the, in our Western cities? Mm. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, we think that um, our aid should be sending flying cars to the developing world countries in the Indo-Pacific and not one of the people the recipient uh, from the recipient countries knows how to work them. Mm. How pointless will that be? Mm. Just because we have the desire to see these countries have what we have sure. so we can feel better about ourselves, saying that we've given them the best technology that we have. That's not what they mm. require. Mm. They require more basic stuff. And they need things that aren't automated because they have a lot of people that they need mm. to employ to do stuff. And educate. 
they exactly. what people they need and want to. So the and other, keep connected, it yeah. seems. The important. other side of this Correct. too that is really significant is if we transfer technology, then productivity will go up in a lot of developing countries. Mm-hmm. And if we genuinely believe in fair trade, that really shouldn't freak us out too much. Mm-hmm. Because in the main, with the cost of labour in most of the developing world, even with better technology and higher productivity, they are still going to be producing you know, goods, food, services for each other more than for us, we're not going to lose business to them in most situations because the cost of doing things here is relatively high. The mm. cost there is relatively low. We're not talking about destabilizing the global economy by giving people technology transfer that then makes them direct economic competitors. Mm. We're talking about making sure that countries can provide better for their people and for their immediate neighborhood yep. mm. of things that are lower tech. So what it really indicates is if you are a more advanced economy – what are you doing doing things that could be done by people who need this level of economic activity to help them develop, that they can't jump 10 steps? Mm. And we should already be at that advanced level. Oh, you'd think. Mm. And the funny thing is that, you know, we're, we're currently going through the fourth industrial revolution. So we've got the robots and the algorithms taking over. More and more people are going to be unemployed. Mm. We talk about countries that if they have those kind of levels of systemic unemployment within their countries, that will allow them to end up having ceaseless civil end turmoil, up with social political oh, problems. Yeah. So you know, huge. revolution, all kinds of things that are going to totally unravel whatever development goes on. So giving them hope that they can plan for the future in a long-term uh, perspective and they can employ people to do stuff which is going to benefit them and also their immediate region makes sense from an aid perspective. So one of the biggest understandings I've come from questioning you guys here is that moving slowly for these countries, both socially, technology, and in many respects, is actually very sensible because Correct. moving too fast, like we have even done for some instances in the West, we have just adopted things without thinking of the consequences. Mm. Moving too fast will uh, unsettle at best their country. Yeah. Yeah. At yeah. best. And yeah. at worst, they've seen what happens mm. when change is too rapid. Absolutely. And when expectations are too high and delivery falters. Yeah. Yeah. So they try and avoid, you know, keep expectations manageable and deliver. Yeah. That seems to be the long-term planning goal of goals. Yeah. It's... Pragmatic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, John's got to go. So I won't ask the last question about the report, but <laughs> thank you very much. I'm, I'm very interested to uh, hear about your report more l- later on. Thank you for joining us, John. Thank you very much, Tim. And thank you, David. Thank you, Tim. Thanks for listening, everyone. We hope that you'll join us for our next exciting adventure through the world of geopolitics. Remember that you can subscribe to Strategicon through the Oscast Network, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn and Spotify. And please like us on the Sage International Australia Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. We appreciate your support. For those of you who would like to support our podcast, please take a look at our merchandise page on the SIA website. There are t-shirts and caps in multiple colours. There are clocks, there are mugs, and importantly, there are beer steins. Mmm, drinking a frosty beer out of a Strategicon stein is one of life's simple pleasures, especially when listening to Strategicon. Also, please comment on any of our articles and podcasts through Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and of course, on the Sage International Australia site. We welcome any constructive feedback that can help improve our products, and we look forward to engaging with our followers. Until next time, goodbye. Connect with your potential customers wherever they are. Effective uses Comcast viewership data insights to combine advanced targeting capabilities with premium TV and streaming content so you can deliver the best ad experiences to your audience no matter how they watch. Visit EFFECTV.com.